All right. Um, so, um, so for our last um, kind of topic here, we're, we're going to be looking at um, probability and statistics uh, in in using that to run uh, computational sim simulations that involve using randomness to basically to simulate um, experiments. So, so to simulate running experiments and sampling from populations uh, in order to come up with uh, things. So, uh, but, but yeah, so, so before we get to that though, it's, it's a good idea to, um, you know, again, this is supposed to be a bit of a review. I hope you've at least come across some of these things in statistics, like, you know, what we mean by calculating a mean and, and what the standard deviation or the variance is of, of a set of data, those kinds of things. Um, so um, in this video lecture, I'm going to cover, um, the, in this first lecture, we'll probably cover the first half of this. So we'll go over basic probability, um, so what a sample space is and counting events and things. Um, and then talk a little bit about random uh, variables and get into what we mean by discrete um, and continuous probability distributions, okay? And then in the next video, we'll probably talk about um, some specific discrete and continuous probability distributions that are good to know. So these are very useful when you're building Monte Carlo um, simulations like we talk about uh, here uh, in this section of the class to know about these um, so you can use them to, 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 to build simulations that draw from different kinds of um, probability distributions. So, um, so I'm mainly going to be going through, uh, like I said, the this lecture 13 notebook um, um, that you should have in your class repository. So, um, so probability. So at its most basic, um, um, I mean, you know, so, so probability certainly gets difficult, um, um, but um, uh, the, the way we start off is that it's really about counting things, right? So if you can formally define kind of your what's known as the sample space, um, and you're able to correctly count up things, um, that, that's the beginning of how you determine probabilities of, of things that are going to happen, okay? So as a quick example, um, if you want to talk about doing experiments like flipping coins. So this is classic for beginning probability. Flipping coins or rolling dice or playing cards or things like that. Um, so the sample case, sample space for flipping uh, a coin would be uh, either heads or tails can come up. So, so each time you perform a trial or an experiment where you flip a coin, um, one, there's one of two, po one of two possible outcomes, uh, head or tail. Uh, for rolling the dice, you've got six outcomes. Um, um, the, the face that comes up could be one, two, three, four, five, or six, right? Um, um, jumping ahead here a little bit, if, if, if this is a fair coin or a fair dice, um, all of these outcomes should be equally likely, right? So um, um, uh, the, by the definition of probability, the, the probability um, has to be some value between zero and one, um, and then and the sum of all of the outcomes of your sample space has to add up to one. So when you have a bunch of things that are equally likely, um, that they you have to divide uh, the number of outcomes you have by one to figure out the individual probability. So for, for a fair coin, you have a 50-50 chance or, or a 0.5 probability of a head occurring and a 0.5 probability of a tail occurring, right? For a fair dice roll, um, if it's not a loaded dice, or a loaded coin, um, e each one of the six outcomes is equally likely, so you have a one in six chance, or um, um, whatever one six is, um, uh, probability basically, right? Um, all right, so a couple more definitions. Um, an event um, is a subset of, a, of the possible outcomes of sample space. So if you, if you study, study beginning probability formally, uh, Sets and set theory are used to um, formalize most of the, the first sorts of um, uh, results in, in basic probability theory, right? So, so um, we, we often think of things in terms of sets. Um, so, so yeah, for, for a, um, uh, a coin flip, you know, one event is a head, one event is a tail. For rolling a dice, you can talk about the event of, of a rolling one, but you can have more complex events, so you can talk about the event of an even number coming up 
um, when you roll a dice, right? So in that case, the event um, consists of three possible points or outcomes, two, four, six, right? Um, a few other terms that, that I might uh, come up with or I might use uh, in this lecture. Uh, we can talk about the complement of an event. Okay, so the complement of, of, of some event occurring in a sample space is, is always in relationship to a span, uh, some sample, bigger sample space, right? So you can talk about the you can talk about the complement of the event of an even roll coming up on a dice. So, so the complement of an even roll would be uh, the uh, an odd roll, one three five, right? Um, so complements are what are known as mutually mutually exclusive or they're disjoint um, events, right? So, but, 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 yeah, back to these. Um, so the complements, so the, the full sample space is one through six, um, and the event of getting an even roll is two, four, six. So the complement of that is the things not in the, the E set, but, but this part of the sample space. So it would be one, three, five, right, or the odd numbers in this case. Notationally, again, this is from set theory and mathematics. We use this E ticked or E prime to rep represent the complement, right? So, so the, the complement of evens is E prime, the, the odds. Or I could rename that something like O for odds here, right? Um, so uh, it's important you understand what we mean by things being mutually exclusive or disjoint. Um, so, so the... the, the the complement of something is always mutually exclusive. So by that, we, we mean that um, they have nothing in common, basically. They have no sample points in common. So the evens and the odd events for, from rolling a dice um, are disjoint, are mutually exclusive. Um, and again, I probably won't use it uh, in, in this lecture, but if you do take basic probability, uh, lots of stuff, uh, the be beginning stuff you do use in uh, set theory. So it's good to understand what we mean by the... Um, the intersection and the union of events. So the, the intersection are uh, the, the things that you have in common. That's like the an and operation, like a logical and, basically. So the, 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 inter, the, the um, intersection of the even and the odds, the intersection of any complementary events is going to be what's known as the null set. They have nothing in common. There's no intersection. But if I had an event of the evens, two, four, six, and I had a, an event of rolling something three or less, one, two, three, their intersection would be two, because they, they both have two in, in them, one, two, three, and two, four, six, right? Uh, and then the union is kind of like a, a logical or. Um, so, so the union of two disjoint things returns or gives you back the original full sample space, right? So the union of the evens and the odds is one, two, three, four, five, six, or, or the, the full sample space, um, all, all the events that are possible when rolling a six-sided dice, right? Okay, uh, moving on. So, like I said, I mean, basic probability comes down to be able to count things accurately, especially when we have combinations or permutations of things, stuff like that. So uh, here's a couple of concepts that you should uh, know to, to understand probability or to understand how to calculate probabilities. Um, so first of all, um, there's a rule called the multiplication rule. So if, if you have um, some operation that can be formed in ways um, and you have a second operation that can be formed in, a, in another in ways, so in one ways and in two ways, the number of ways that the two operations can be performed together is, is the multiplication of those, n1 times n2, okay? So concretely, um, if I want to know of how many outcomes, possible outcomes there are in the sample space when I roll a dice and flip a coin. Um, and here, notice um, it, it doesn't matter whether I roll the dice first, then flip the coin, or flip the coin, uh, and then roll the dice. So, so order doesn't matter here. Um, but, but the multiplication rule tells me there's 12 possible outcomes in, in that case, right? Um, and um, here, and, and since this class is, is also about using programming and using Python, here's a little bit of Python code to kind of illustrate um, that. Um, so, so here, if we have our set of outcomes for uh, the, the elements for flipping a coin, so heads or tails, um, the set of outcomes for a dice element, um, we can use this nice iter tools library to do things like calculate, um, uh, enumerate the, the products um, or the permutations or the combinations of things. So, 
So you'll see some examples of using that here. So in this case, if you use the product function from iter tools and you give it, you can give it as many lists or sets as you want and it'll, it'll enumerate all of the possible outcomes. Um, but again, this is without regard, regard to order when you use this product function. So, uh, so flipping a heads and, and getting a one is considered the same as one as rolling a one and, and getting a head, right? So we don't list one head um, a, a second time here. It's the same outcome. So anyway, um, um, you know, this is small enough you can enumerate it yourself. So, so by the multiplication rule. You know, so there, there was two outcomes for the, the head, head toss, um, the, the coin toss, and six outcomes for rolling the dice. So there should be 12 outcomes possible when, when um, you do these together, right? And this is the enumeration of all 12 of those, right? So you could flip a, a head followed by any particular face of the dice coming up, or you could flip a tail followed by any face of the dice coming up. So. Um, So lots of times we need to repeat kind of the same experiment over and over, right? Um, so this is, this is kind of a corollary to the multiplication rule. Um, so if, if you're repeating like an operation, like, like repeatedly flipping a coin or repeatedly rolling a dice, um, so, so if I'm flipping the coin twice, there should be, by the multiplication rule, there should be two times two or four possible outcomes, right? Head, 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 tail, tail, head, or tail, tail. Um, uh, we could get, right? Um, so, um, in, 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 right, if I'm flipping the coin four times, um, um, there's 16 possible outcomes, right? So here, I mean, order does kind of matter. Um, it, it matters um, um, so because we're not counting up the, the number of heads or the number of tails. Um, we, we do want to know, you know, did I... Um, what I flipped first, then what I flipped second, what I flipped third, when I flipped fourth, right? Um, so, so yeah, th this corollary tells us that that uh, you can also specify that as so the number of outcomes um, is two for each individual trial. Uh, each individual he head flip has two outcomes, and if we do it four times, it's, it's two times two times two times two, or two to the power of four, right? Um, so this is a useful thing to know. I mean, in general, in computer science. So, for example, whenever you do stuff with binary numbers, um, um, you should know that um, I, I can know how many. If I have ten bits, for example, I, I know that that means that there's two to the ten possible values. Um, so in that case, or, or 1,024 values, right? Um, and and, and the, the the passable values for that would go would range from zero, where all the bits are zero, up to 1,023. So so one minus that. Right? Or, you know, four, with four bits, like like four uh, um, coin flips, um, you know, you get the value, you get 16 values, and that ranges with all the bits being zero to all the, in decimal to all the bits being one, gives you a 15. So, so there's 16 um, outcomes here, or 16 unique values that, that could be represented with four bits, basically. So. Um, So, so, so there, there's two things then, uh, let's get more specific um, and, and talk about what we really mean by whether order matters or not. So, so uh, the, the, the two ways of counting things are known as taking the permutations of things or taking the combinations of things, okay? So taking the permutations of things is um, um, when order matters, you want to permute things, okay? So th this is uh, an arrangement of a set of objects um, and uh, order matters. So uh, the, the typical way I think of where you need to use permutations is like if I want to line up people in a line. If I have four people, how many different ways are there of lining them up um, in, in a queue or something to, to check them out at a store or something like that, right? Um, so permutations, the, the, the basic thing of, of permutations is if I want to arrange all of these items, um, there's going to be in factorial ways of doing that because basically, like, like if I have four people, I can pick one of the four people to be first in line. So, so I can start with, with Alice. Now once I've picked Alice, 
then I've got a choice of three people to be second in line. So, so I can e either pick Bob Carroll or Derek. And then once I pick my, my person second in line, I've, I've got two left and then one left, all right? So again, by the multiplication rule, I had four, n was four for the first time, and then three times two times one, right? So, so there's going to be um, four factorial or 24 ways of permuting uh, four people to line them up um, in a line here. And again, uh, the order definitely matters here. I mean, there's only four people. So, so if order didn't matter, there's, there's only the, the same group of these four people. But there's 24 different ways of kind of permuting them or, or lining them up uh, here. Um, so, so yeah, I already went over that. So you, should, you could, should be able to kind of intuitively see why it's in factorial. You know, so you, you, you select from all of the full set for your first one and then n minus 1 for your second item, then n minus 2, and so on, down to 1, if, if you're selecting all of them. So, um, so a more general um, um, rule, or, or more general permutation, though, is, is maybe you want to s um, select from a set of four people, but I only want to select two of the four, right? Um, so like I said in this example, for example, let's, let's say how, you want to figure out how many ways there are if these four people are in a club of uh, selecting two people to be officers, uh, where the, the order matters in the sense that it's different if I select Alice for president and Bob for treasurer, that, that's a different selection than, than Bob for the president and Alice for treasurer, right? Um, so in that case, um, again, intuitively you should see it, it, it's the same logic. Um, I have four people... If I'm first going to figure out uh, who is going to be president, one of the, one of the four can be president, and and if the same person can't hold the, the both offices, then I've got three left for the second office for treasure. So it's going to be four times three, or twelve uh, total ways of, of selecting among the four people um, to assign them or or, or, or uh, have them serve in these two offices for the, this club here. Right. Um, So the general expression is this, um, and, and um, if you know what a factorial is, the, you, you, could, you could have probably come up uh, with this on your own because n minus r, this is, this is permute uh, n objects where we select r of them, uh, right? So, so permute four people where we select two of them for, our, for the offices here. Um, so n factorial is, is n times n minus 1 times n minus 2. n minus r, so, so um, if, if it's 4 minus 2, then this is going to be like 2 time, times 1, right? So basically the, the bottom um, cancels out the things in the factorial and we're just left with 4 times 3, right? So this works in general for any n and r to figure out how many ways there are of permuting n items where we're just taking r of them. And of course, if r is equal to n, uh, n minus n is zero. By definition, zero factorial is one. So you get just n factorial if I'm permuting, uh, making a permutation of all four items. So, um, okay. So you just have to remember um, permutations, um, order matters when, when you're permuting a set. It's like lining up people, the, the order that they're in the line matters. Um, but, but Often, so the more useful one um, is counting the number of, of combinations of n things taken r r time. Um, so, and this is where um, order doesn't matter, right? Um, so, uh, for one thing, um, um, if you take n things um, um, and and you take all n of them, there's only one way of taking n things and all n of them. So, so again, if I have four people. Um, selecting all four of them when order doesn't matter, there's only one way to select all four of them. You, you get all of them, right? So by definition, uh, n combinations of n things is, is one. Um, and n combinations where you select zero of them, there's only one way of selecting zero things. So n select zero is also going to be one. Okay. Um, so... Um, So in, in general, though, if I, if I want to select R things from a set of N where order doesn't matter, so go, going back to the four people, um, let's say that, that you need to form a committee, um, and it doesn't matter, you know, that there's no roles on the committee. You just need two people from the set of four. So, so in that case, you're doing a combination. Uh, how many ways could I form this committee 
from the four for selecting the two people, right? So, you know, if you go back and look at this, um, Alice and Bob is the same as Bob and Alice. So, so, so every one of these is, is listed twice. So there's actually only six ways of doing that. I mean, if, if you look through this by inspection, because we get Alice Bob and we get Bob Alice, but that would be the same committee. Or we get Alice Carol and we get Carol Alice, right? Um, so the expression for, for figuring that out is, is this. So it's pretty similar to permutations, but we have the uh, we also divide by R factorial as well. Um, and if you look at that, you could probably um, figure out why that's the case. Um, but um, All right, so uh, just another quick example. So, so that was a relatively small example um, and, and, and easy enough that we can enumerate all the possibilities of our permutations or the combinations uh, if we want to. But, uh, of course, you can use this to, to calculate um, the number of combinations of things or permutations of things uh, where it's not so easy. So we might ask a question, uh, how many ways are there of getting two cards dealt from a standard 52 deck uh, uh, card deck, right? So if you're not familiar with the card deck, um, there, there's, there's 13 suits, um, um, like uh, 13 um, uh, different um, um, face cards, uh, values for cards, so 2, 3, 4 through 10, and then jack, queen, king, and ace. Uh, and there's four suits, um, so, so um, clubs, diamonds, uh, spades um, um, and and hearts, right? So anyway, so, so there's 52 cards. So, so how many ways are, are are there of dealing two cards? So, so there, there's there's 52 ways of dealing one card, right? So if you so you could if you select so in 52 choose one is 52. Uh, you select one of the 52 cards. Uh, but how many ways? So here again, order isn't matter. It doesn't matter. So if I get um, a jack of clubs and an ace of spades, it's the same as if I first dealt the ace of spades and jack of clubs. That's the same pair um, being dealt from the deck. Right? So you need to use combinations in that case. So so if you just plug these in, you get 1,326. Um, um, So both, uh, another concept we're, we're going to be talking about is whether we're selecting with or without replacement here. So both permutations and combinations are, are really doing the selection uh, without replacement. So, so, so that's most clear here in the card case. So once you select one card, um, you know, once you're dealt one card, there's 51 remaining. Then, then you select the second card um, from the deck, and you have 50 remaining. Um, but sometimes we sample from a set or a sample space with replacement. Um, so we already had really kind of had an example of this. So the, the, the flipping the, the coin four times, um, you can think of that as having four separate coins that you all flip simultaneously, or you can think of it as flipping one coin and then replacing it and flipping again, right? So, so that, that's kind of the, the same idea as doing some repeated trial with replacement. Um, I just have the one coin, um, I flip it, and then I, I get it, and I, I just repeatedly flip it however many times that I want. Right? Um, so I guess this is kind of um, um, just a repeat of, of, of what we already did here. So another example, though. Um, um, so we talked about this, the multiplication rule. Um, so like, like if we have a bag with three balls, um, and we're going to sample four of them, but with replacement. So, so, so in this case, we've got three possible outcomes. We could pick the red, green, or blue ball. But if we put it back and, and we sample, we draw four times. Uh, how many different um, sequences, basically, um, can we end up getting? Um, 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 you know, doing that that experiment. And there's three to the four, or 81. So, so we could end up getting all four red balls each time. We pick the red ball, put it back get lucky, pick it all four times, or whatever. And so this is the, the complete enumeration of all the 81 sequences. So. Um, okay, so, so that, that, was, that was about kind of um, uh, counting things. Um, so, so why do we go into that? Well, because 
as I already mentioned, the, 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 the start of, of being able to calculate probability of things is, is if you can accurately count them up. Um, and, and so that's what this section is about then. So, so how do we use those ideas to start calculating probabilities, all right? So as I already mentioned, the, um, the likelihood or uh, of the occurrence of an event um, is evaluated by a real number that we call a probability, and probabilities range from 0 to 1, okay? So, so all probabilities have to be um, some value between 0 and 1 um, that we assign to an event. Um, the sum, so this is important, um, so, so definitely you know, make certain you understand this. The sum of all the probabilities uh, of all the possible events that occur has to sum up to 1. Okay, so um, so I already mentioned this. So for rolling the dice, there's six possible outcomes. Um, so when you roll the dice, one of those six outcomes has to occur. You know, a one comes up or a two comes up or whatever. But in the in the total set, so for a fair dice, uh, there has to be a one six probability. And if you sum up all the, the probabilities of the six outcomes, they have to sum up to one. You know, they have the, the, the density, what's known as the the probability density of your uh, sample space has to total up to one uh, over all of the, the possible events, okay? Um, so um, from some of our uh, previous definitions we talked about, so if we have an event, an event could be a, a subset of some outcomes or points in our sample space, like, like what, what's the event, uh, what's the probability of the event of rolling an even number on a dice, okay? So in that case, it's the sum of the probabilities of the individual sample points. Um, so, so it's one six, so there's one six chance of getting a two, one six chance of getting a four, and one six chance of getting a six. So one six plus one six plus one six gives you one half, right? So there's a 50% chance of rolling an even number and a 50% chance of rolling an odd number on, on a dice. Um, or a more complicated um, uh, example. So what is the probability of um, rolling, um, of, of getting three heads in a row if I flip a fair coin three times, or if I, if I flip three fair coins simultaneously, right? Um, so here, again, the reason why order matters is because you have to do, you have to count up. You know, um, you have to think of this as either the first coin flip, or if I have three separate coins, this is the outcome outcome for coin one in the first column, and then this is the outcome for for coin two or the second coin flip. So, so so even though you know I have a couple of different ways of having two heads and one tail, those are those are uh, different outcomes. There's eight different ways um, that that um, the, the three coin flips um, uh, could come out um, in, in this here. Um, so in, in this total sample space of flipping three coins, um, if the coin is fair, each one of these has to be equally likely, right? So, um, so again, in this sample space, so, so these represent the outcomes for this experiment. Um, uh, I can have eight possible sequences of my three coin flips. Um, and if, if all the flips are fair, each one has to be equally likely. So each one of these has to have a one in eight chance of, of being what actually happens if I run this experiment, right? Um, a, a, another way you can come up with this, um, so there's, there's like the multiplication rule, there, there's a rule called the product rule for, product, for probabilities. So um, if you're repeating, if you're, if you're doing a sequence of things um, that, that have a probability of, of occurring, the, 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 the probability that one particular sequence will, will occur in order is just the product, the multiplication of those probabilities. So in this case, since each one of these has a 50-50 a, a, a chance, a one in two chance, um, if you multiply one half times one half times one half would be the probability of getting a head for the first flip, and then a head for the second flip, and a head for the third flip. And, and, and again, you know, these match, so you get one eighth again for each of these. Uh, but that will come up later because um, if, if I was using um, a, an unbalanced coin, um, I, could, um, I, I, can't, I can't use um, this idea of, of evenly dividing the subspace. Like, like if the coin had a, um, a one in three chance of being a head, so, so it was uh, weighted to come up tails, 
Uh, if I wanted to know the chance of getting ahead, I'd have to multiply one-third times one-third times one-third if, if the coin was unfair to, to figure out what the actual probability is of getting three of these unfair coin flips in a row. So, um, Okay. So, um, so, so yeah, I mean, that, that's the beginning of probability. So, so we figured out kind of what the probability is of each of these outcomes occurring in this um, sample space or this, this experiment that we're talking about. Um, here's our first example then. Uh, this is really uh, an example of a Monte Carlo simulation, uh, kind of the topic of, of, of things in this, this class here. Uh, in this section of the class. Um, so by that, it's really just, we, what, let's say, you know, you didn't really believe this. Um, I mean, you could empirically run this, uh, you could empirically do this e experiment for real. You could get three coins um, and flip them a thousand times and just count up the number of times that three heads came up, right? Um, and you wouldn't expect to get the exact probability, um, but you would expect, if I did it a thousand times, I, I would get it close to about 125 times, I would get all three coins coming up heads, right, if you ran that, right? I mean, there's going to be some, some variation, uh, but, but uh, if the coin was fair, you know, you would, you would um, be very surprised if you, didn't, if, if you never came up with all three heads, um, um, uh, because you do expect. Um, so... Of course, that would take a long time to do that in reality. So uh, for computer simulations, though, we can simulate experiments like that that, that are statistical in nature, uh, assuming we've got a good random number generator that, that, that works, that, that really gives us real random numbers. Okay? And, and we'll talk about that later in this course, what we mean by a good random number generator. Um, but here's the basics of... of what we call, you know, these kinds of statistical simulations or Monte Carlo simulations. Um, they all look basically like this, right? So if I wanted to run that experiment, um, say, flip a thousand times and see experimentally, you know, um, simulated uh, experimentally, uh, what the actual count is of, of three heads coming up. Um, I, I could do this as a loop. We run a thousand times um, and we flip three coins here. So here's uh, an example of using the, the NumPy's random number library. So that there's, a, there's a couple functions. Um, um, I'll talk about some others here later on. So the one basic good one for this is that uh, you can ask choice will return with an equal probability. So this is a, uh, a function that's um, known as a, a uniform uh, probability here. So if you give it a list or a set of, of items, it, it will be equally likely to select one of them. Uh, and return it for you. So here, coin um, was from a previous cell um, is either H or T, representing heads or tails, right? So I have have a fifty percent chance of returning a head and a fifty percent chance of returning a tail if I call choice. Right? So you flip the coin three times, um, or you flip three separate coins, whichever way you want to think about it, um, and then we count up the number of heads here, right? So. Um, um, so basically, this if statement is only true if all three coins are equal to H or, or all equal to heads, right? Um, so we count up the number of successes, uh, where success means that we got the outcome that we're trying to measure um, in this random experiment, right? Um, and if you run that, so so you know, th this is a bit low, you know, we expect to have about 125. But again, you won't all, you won't get exactly 125. You'd be you'd also be surprised if you always get exactly 125. Uh, because that would mean your random number generator isn't isn't very random or is, it's doing something wrong, right? But every time you run this, we should sometimes expect to get values a bit above 125, uh, but and sometimes get values below 125. So we got 139 that time, 133, and so on. But each time you should get uh, slightly different. Right? Um, and, and another thing, you know, so I won't. Uh, in, in later notebooks, uh, we talk about why this is. This this is uh, due to the central limit theorem. But basically, for these kinds of random simulations, uh, you'll get a more accurate estimate of the true probability if you can run the experiment or, or, or do the sample more times. So, so if I do 100,000 times instead of 1,000, um, I would expect to get something. Because again, the, the, the true probability should be 0 0.125000. Um, and it will tend to be uh, a better estimate if I can run the experiment more times or, or get more samples uh, for my experiment there. So. 
Um, okay, moving on. Um, Uh, in, in general, then, kind of to formalize a little bit of, of what we were just saying here, uh, the, the, the basic way to compute probabilities is that uh, if, if we, first of all, if we can count the number of items in the sample space, big N here, um, and for the special cases where all of those possible outcomes, big N, are equally likely, so, you know, it's, it's equally likely to be dealt any two um, cards, um, you know, so it's equally likely to get any card from a well-shuffled deck of cards. Um, here, if the, if the coin is fair, it's equally likely to get heads or tails. So that, so, to, to, if, if you want to know the, the probability of getting some, um, some event A, you know, so the probability of getting three heads, what we were just doing here, uh, you just have to know how many times among the big N the, 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 the outcomes or the sample points in the event that, that you're trying to calculate the probability of occur, right? So that, that gives you the probability of the event A, right? So there's only one way in eight that you can get three heads, right? But if I want to know the pro what, what's the probability I can get uh, two heads, right? So, um, or uh, I think what I said here in the notebook is what's, what's the probability I can get two or more heads? Somewhere I, oh yeah, right here. So, so the, the probability of get two more heads is where I get, you have to find all the outcomes where you have two heads or three heads, right? So, so there's one where I have three heads, and then there's one, two, three, um, three more where I have two heads, right? So this one, this one, and this one. So there's four total of the eight possible equally likely outcomes um, where I have two heads or three heads. So the probability of getting two or more heads is... Um, one eighth plus one eighth plus one eighth plus one eighth, or, or one half, uh, in that case. Right. Um, okay. So I think I'm going to um, go a little bit. I'm going to go through all of this this example here. So this is a little bit more complex example. Um, Let's say, uh, um, if you know how to play poker, um, um, you know that, that in, in the standard game of poker, you use a standard deck of 52 cards, so you can calculate the, the probabilities of getting certain hands in poker. So, so uh, in this part of the notebook, we ask, uh, what's the probability of getting a, being dealt a pair, right? So it's a little bit more complicated, um, the, but the basic is that... Um, um, the, the the basic way to think about it. Um, so first of all, you have to know how many possible uh, uh, five card hands are there, right? So we, we calculated already how many possible two card hands there are. So so to calculate the number of five card hands, it's it's fifty two uh, choose five. So, so use combinations again because order doesn't matter on, on the hand, um, and and that comes out to be close to two point six million. Two million six, two million five hundred ninety-eight thousand, right there. Okay. So here's a um, a function from SciPy. Um, this gives you the the count of the number of combinations instead of enumerating all the combinations here. Um, So um, let me skip aces. So let's say you want to calculate the number of ways of getting a, a pair of cards. Um, so I won't go into the, the details of this, um, but so this is useful if you want to get if you want to be good at poker to be able to, to to calculate the probabilities of like getting a pair or getting two pairs or the, the different special hands, right? So, so to, to correctly calculate the 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 ways of getting pairs, um, um, for, we know big N, the, the number of possible five card hands, um, 52 choose five. Um, so to calculate the number of pairs, you have to, so one of the 13 ranks um, is going to form your pair. So maybe, you know, you get a pair of twos or a pair of threes or whatever. So, so there's 13 choose one ways of pick, picking one of the ranks to be your pair. 
So, so, so you know, so maybe we pick uh, aces. Now, if, if you pick aces, uh, there's four aces. So there's four choose two ways uh, of, of getting a pair of aces. Ace of clubs or an ace of spades uh, or an ace of clubs with an ace of diamonds or so on, right? Um, so that's where this one comes in. So, so once you have that, though, um, then you have to pick your other three cards, okay? So for the, the other three cards can't be another one of, of the, the original one that you picked. Um, so if I picked aces, I've got 12 other things left. I can't pick a third ace. So among the, the 12 ranks that aren't my pair, I need to pick three more cards. So that's where the 12 pick, choose uh, three comes from here. Um, and then... Um, once I pick the, the three different, th these have to be three different cards, you know, because I don't want to form a second pair, right? Um, um, so, but anyway, so, so once I pick my three different cards, I, I have to pick one of those four. So four choose one. So uh, besides my two aces, if, if I I've select a two, a three, and a four, um, this expression is, is saying, okay, for the twos, do I, I pick the two of clubs or the two of spades or the two arts, whatever. So... Um, and I have to do that three times, basically. So, so uh, four choose one times four choose one times four choose. And and again, the reason why you multiply these together is it's the multiplication rule again. So, so once you have all these, you multiply those all together, and this is going to give you the number of possible um, combinations of hands that have exactly one pair. So, so it's it's this expression: one million ninety-eight thousand two hundred forty. So then the, the, the probability of getting a pair is that divided by the total number of five-card hands, or, or uh, about 42%, basically. Right? So I'll leave it as, um, if you're interested in that, like, like try and figure out how, how, what's the probability of getting three of a kind. So, so drawing three is a similar kind of derivation. You, you can check your, your probability, like looking at, say, Wikipedia's um, probability page or something. So. Um, oh, and, yeah, and here's using the com function to actually calculate that just to verify um, um, where that 42% came from, basically. So. All right. Um, yeah. Moving on. Um, so one, once you have the, 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 the idea of what a probability is, um, we can start talking about... Um, um, uh, uh, what are known as probability distributions, okay? So, so defining a, a space of probabilities. Um, so, so we've already kind of had those. So, so, so the things we've been talking about, the sample space and then, and then um, 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 the, the, the probabilities of each of these outcomes is an example of a probability distribution. But now we need to be able to, to consider more complex things where the... Um, probabilities of the outcomes aren't all equally likely, that kind of thing, okay? So, um, again, so a few definitions again. Um, so a, a statistical experiment is a process in which several chance ob observations are generated. Um, and, and we're basically going to be using probability to characterize the, the, the chances of, of certain of, of outcomes occurring, basically. Um, so a random variable, um, so when we start talking about probability distributions, uh, these are in regards to what are known as random variables. Um, this is a function that associates a real number with each element in a sample space of some statistical experiment, right? Um, so here, we're taking kind of our more symbolic, um, so, so, I mean, the one reason why this is useful is by turning it into numbers, then we can do um, computational methods. We can do computer simulations with these random variables, right? Or more easily, anyway. Um, so um, an example makes this clear. So in theory, you can turn any sample space into a random variable by counting something. So, so we might turn our sample space of flipping a single coin um, into a random variable H by just counting the number of heads that occur, right? So in this case, um, our random variable is H, um, and it's 1 when the head comes up, and it's 0 when the tails come up. 
Or for the more complex, when we're flipping three coins, if, if, if H is defined as the number of heads you see, um, you know, we have eight outcomes, but the random variable only has uh, three different outcomes, right? Because either we get all three heads can occur in one way, but sometimes we can get two heads. So if there's three different ways we can get two heads, three different ways we can get one head, uh, and one way that we can get zero heads, okay? So, so this random variable maps um, our original sample space um, into three different outcomes, zero, one, two, or three uh, heads here, right? Um, okay, so uh, some more definitions. Um, um, so it's very important that there's a distinction between what are uh, discrete sample spaces and what are continuous sample spaces. Um, so it's a little bit beyond the scope to, to get in, in to, to, to the, the real details of, of the difference of these. Uh, it suffices for this class to understand it um, kind of intuitively. So discrete sample spaces are just sample spaces where you use whole numbers to represent um, the things. Okay, so, so this is an example of a discrete sample space. So technically, um, if there's a finite number like this, there's a finite number of values for a random variable, 0, 1, 2, or 3. Or if, if, if it, really, if they're just integers. So, uh, so discrete sample spaces where it can be 0 to any big large number. So any large number is possible, but as long as it's an integer, a whole number, it's still a discrete um, sample space, right? Um, and then continuous sample spaces are continuous random variables are variables that can take on any value in the continuous range, okay? So, so again, um, what it means in practical terms is if you need to use like a floating point number in a computer to represent it, it it's really a continuous uh, random variable that we're dealing with, right? So technically, if we, if, if um, like, like think of like a number line from zero to one, so there's actually infinitely many points on a number line from zero to one. So if if your outcome um, can be mapped, you know, it can be represented by something like that. So, so uh, there, there's an infinite number of possibilities. Then it's really a continuous random variable that, that you're dealing with. So. Um, all right. So so even though we divide uh, these probability distributions up into discrete versus continuous, um, that they're, they're, they, they have basically the same concepts, okay? So, so, um, so yeah, let, let's talk about um, a discrete probability distribution first. So, um, when we talk about a probability distribution uh, that's discrete, basically we have a set of ordered pairs, x and f of x, where x is the random variable like this, right? Um, uh, like, like our H that we define for the coin. And F of X, um, in these, you know, if you ever take a course specifically on studying probability, F of X is used to represent the probability of a random variable um, like H, right? So F of X is just probably, so, so here the probability of, of three, F, F of H, or F of three is one in eight because there's one way of getting three coin flips. The probability of, of two, F of two, is going to be three eight because there, there's three different ways that we can get, end up with two heads um, when we flip three coins. Right? So that's, that's what we're talking about here for this set of ordered pairs. So this, this is known as our probability function. So for a discrete probability distribution um, where you have a finite set of, of outcomes, you, you can use a table to represent your, um, um, your, your mapping from your random variable to its probability, basically. All right. So that, that's what we, we call the probability function, or for this discrete case, we call that the probability mass function, uh, or in, in general, the probability distribution. So we use probability distribution whether we mean a, a discrete or a continuous probability distribution. So. Um, so there's there's a couple of properties um, that have to hold for this for these, this, this table of pairs in order for it to be a proper probability distribution. So first of all, all the probabilities um, uh, of your outcome of your random variable have to be greater than or equal to zero, um, 
and they actually also have to be less than one, less than or equal to one, right? Because uh, a proper probability can't be more than one. It has to be between zero and one. So, 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 so every one of these has to be greater than or equal to zero and, and less than one. The sum over all of the possible um, um, outcomes of the random variable has to sum up to one. So we're, we already kind of talked about that. So, so to be a proper probability distribution, though, every outcome, um, the, the sum of, of all the possible outcomes for some random variable or some experiment um, has to sum up to one, right? And that, that's what this property two means here. Uh, and then three, the, the, the probability of some outcome is just f of x. So f of x is that it gives the, the, the mapping from a random variable to an outcome. So, so again, more concretely, if we go back to the, um, the, the random variable, which is counting up the number of heads for the three coin flip uh, experiment, the, the, this here, the, the x and the f of x, represents our discrete um, mass probability mass function here. So, so f of x, so f of 3 is 0 0.125 because there's one way of getting three heads, uh, f of 2 and f of 1 are... 0.375 because that, that's the sum of, of the, the, the three different ways we can get two heads and the three different ways we can get one head here. Um, so it's, it's 0.375. And there's one way of getting three tails. So, so f of zero um, is 0.125, right? Um, So, and, and the ways you come up with these probabilities is we use the tools that we previously discussed. So you need to be able to you know, uh, enumerate all the combinations of items and enumerate the, the, the number of items in like a sample point um, um, uh, in order to like determine what f of x is properly for a discrete distribution like this. So, um, let's give one more quick example. So, um, Let's say, again, this is another common thing. If you take a class in probability, um, uh, we use like a bag or an urn of balls. So let's say we have um, a, a, an urn of balls that we're going to draw two from. Um, and, and we've got red balls and black balls in there, right? Um, so in this case, we've got seven balls total, but we've got four red balls and three black balls. And, and here we want to we figure out what, what is the discrete probability distribution for the random variable that's the count of the number of red balls we end up drawing when we draw two balls, okay? So, so here, uh, again, this is going to be discrete, and there's only three possible values for this random variable. So we might draw zero red balls. So, so, so the, the random, so x, if x is our random variable here, we could get zero red ball or one. So we go, draw one red one and one black one or two, right? So, so to figure out the probabilities, if it's equally likely to pick uh, any one of these seven balls, uh, we first have to figure out uh, all the combinations of, of uh, picking one of these balls without replacement um, and then picking a second ball. So, so that's basically, again, using combinations. So, so seven choose two. So there's actually 21 possible ways of doing that. And, and we can list them all out using uh, the iter tools combinations to do that. So we might pick the red ball, red, the first red ball first, followed by the second red ball, and so on. But but this isn't our random variable. Um, this is just the, the possible outcome. So now we have to determine the random variable x, which is the count of the number of red balls. Okay. So to skip down here. So so the same thing if we just count it up. So so for this first outcome, outcome one, um, the random variable was two, and the second one was two, and so on. Right. Now each one of these of the 21 is equally likely. So these all have just a little bit less, these all have a 1 in 21 chance of occurring, assuming that all the, 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 the balls are, you know, the same size and, 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 and you shuffle them up uh, well. Um, you're equally likely to pick one of any of the seven. So you have a 1 in 7 chance, or sorry, a 1 in 21 chance for each one of these outcomes. Um, So, um, so anyway, to, 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 to get our final discrete uh, distribution, then um, we have to, for example, uh, to, we have to count up or add up basically all the probabilities where we get two red balls. So, yeah, so 
getting two red balls can occur one, two, three, four, five, six, six, six ways basically. Um, so six times the the one twenty one uh, um, gives us um, 0 0.28571, right? Um, so, uh, but but that's kind of doing it by hand, right? So so uh, we we could use our tools to to, to calculate those probabilities um, ourselves here. So. Um, so we know big N is seven choose two. There, there, there's 21 possible outcomes. So, so if we want to ask how many ways are there of getting um, two red balls and zero black balls, um, this is the expression that would give us that. Okay. So, so among the four red balls, there's there's four choose two ways of choosing um, two red balls. And among so if we're, if, if we're calculating the probability of getting two red balls, there, there's three choose zero ways or one way of choosing zero black balls here. So if you multiply those together, you come up with six, right? So there's six out of the 21 ways of getting the, the two red balls. And that should uh, equal to, you know, enumerating these all out by hand and then counting up that there were six ways of getting two red balls um, 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 out of the 21. And you can do a similar thing for finding f of one and f of zero, right? So of getting one red and one black or of getting zero red and two black. So one red and one black is four choose one times three choose one, or four times three. So there's 12 out of 21 ways of getting one red and one black. Um, and then of getting two black, there's three choose two, um, which is three ways of getting that. So. Um, all right. So, yeah, I, I should move on here. Um, so i kind of skip over. Is another good way of representing these tables is by giving a um, histogram. So here's our histogram, uh, which, is or, which is really just a bar graph uh, of the um, of the outcome. So again, these three outcomes need to add up to one. So if you, if you sum these up, um, uh, these three here, they, sh they should have added up to one. Um, or if you look at like, like uh, a, a discrete probability as a bar graph like this, the sum of all the bars, if you have a discrete number of them, uh, a finite number of them, should add, add up to one, basically. So again, this represents the what's known as sort of the density of our um, probability distribution here. So we're most likely to get one red and one black, um, and we're slightly more likely to get two reds than to get two blacks, because there were more red balls. You should, you should expect that, because that, there was four red balls and three black balls. So. Um, and um, I, I should so, so the cumulative what's known as the cumulative de density or the cumulative mass function is an important idea so, so this is just if, if you um, add these up okay so so, um, so you can think of this as getting zero or less um, of the random variable coming out as zero or less so, so having zero red balls this is getting one or zero so, so if you add up one plus zero, the cumulative here is, is basically this plus this. Uh, you get that. And then this one, the, the last one is always going to be one when, when you're working with this cumulative distribution because that's the, the sum of getting zero, one, or two. Right? So, so that's, that's, that's all of them have, 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 to be, have to sum up to one here. So, um, we'll talk later, probably um, um, in the second video on this, of, um, of, of why the, the cumulative mass function or the cumulative distribution function can be useful for certain calculations. So. Um, all right, so let's then look at, uh, move on to continuous probability distributions. So these are basically probability distributions where the random variable is a continuous random variable instead of a discrete random variable, right? Um, so here we can no longer, if, if, if our random variable is continuous, we can't have just a simple table to you know, represent the probability distribution. We have to have some function that describes the, 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 the continuous probability um, distribution in this case. Um, but we have the same kind of three properties, but because it's continuous, um, 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 we have to use uh, the, the concept of, of an integral and the area under the integral um, to represent summing up the density to one here. So, so we'll see an example of that 
uh, in a second here, but but really these are the same three properties. So all the probabilities uh, for any particular f of x uh, have to be greater than or equal to zero, uh, and, and but they don't have to actually be less than one, and we'll see why here in, in a second. Um, but the sum of, of all the probabilities for a continuous random variable has to, to sum up to, has to integrate up to one. So the density of, of all the possible outcomes for your continuous random variable have to be one. Um, for similar reasons to why that's true for the discrete case, uh, it's also true for the continuous case. Uh, and then the probability, so you can't talk about the probability of, of, of it being some particular value because um, um, you know, for a continuous variable, it, it's negligible that it's going to be one particular value since there's infinitely number, infinitely many continuous um, um, you know values in, in some uh, line. But it does make sense to, to calculate probabilities on a continuous function, but you have to calculate them in a range, right? So you can talk about the probability of, of your continuous variable being between A and B, basically. And the way to calculate that is to integrate, you know, find the area under the curve from A to B for your probability function, okay? So um, an example will make this clearer, make this more concrete. So, so um, let's just make up a probability function. Um, and first of all, let's see if it's valid probability, continuous probability function here. So, so here, um, we'll say that our probability function f of x is x squared divided by 3 when x is between negative 1 and 2 and a zero elsewhere, okay? So what do we mean by that? Well, so here's an implementation of that function in Python, a vectorized implementation. So here, where x is between negative one and two, um, our function is x squared divided by three, right? And everywhere else, when it's, when it's less than negative one or greater than two, it's zero here, right? So uh, we can plot that function out using um, 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 matplotlib like we've done a lot in this class here. So it's really part of a parabola. It's, it's a parabola, you know, x squared makes parabolas um, from negative one to two. And then everywhere else is zero. Um, so below negative one, above two is zero, okay? Um, so it should be obvious that condition one is satisfied. So uh, the probability is zero or greater than zero everywhere. Although notice some points the probability is, is more than one, which can be a bit confusing to beginning students in probability. So, so we say probabilities have to be between zero and one, so how is it possible for, a, for a, a continuous probability function to have some places where the, the, the function is more than one? Um, but, so, so we can ask pro property two though, is this a valid probability density function? It's only a valid probability density function if the integral, if the area under the curve sums up to one, okay? Um, so we can check that. So, um, so basically the area, I mean, it, it's zero everywhere below negative one and two. So we could just take the integral from negative one to two. That's going to be equivalent to taking the integral from negative infinity to infinity, right? So, so we should get the same thing here. But, but we can check that property, too. Like that here, although I guess I'm going to have to rerun. Um, oh, oh, I've probably redefined um, my... Um, I redefined F later on in there, so why it's not running. So, um, um, so why that's rerunning though? Um, so, so again, in answer to why this can be more than one, it's the, the, the real important thing is that uh, to calculate a, a probability. Like, if I want to know the probability that that um, my value is between one and two. Uh, really, what I need to do is calculate the area under the curve from 1 to 2. So as long as, as the, the, the sum of the area sums up to 1, it's a proper continuous probability density function, right? So even though it can be for uh, the, a point, can be above 1, uh, the, 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 
since the whole area has to sum up to one, uh, that, that doesn't matter uh, if it's about, you know, so, so basically, and if I want to know what the probability is of my of the random value variable between one and two, I have to integrate the function from one to two, basically, you know, find that area. That, that will tell me the probability that, that my random variable ha ends up being some value between one and two, right? So here, um, so, so yeah, back to this, I was trying to show that, that uh, so you get a little bit, you get a little bit more of a precise answer if you limit your, your integral from negative one to two, because again, we're using a, an approximation of the integral here. But, you know, you get, so in both cases, it was basically one, right? So, so we confirmed, we confirmed that this was a good probability density function. Um, So, and you could, could, so in this case, you could actually confirm that analytically. So it's, it's easily, easy to take the antiderivative of this um, and calculate that, that the integral um, is, um, is one for the, over the whole range, right? Um, so, and then real quickly, finally, um, the, the cumulative distribution function also makes sense for continuous um, um, probability distributions. It's basically the area under the curve from negative infinity up to some point um, um, x. Okay, so it's so if I want to know what the cumulative density is from negative infinity to one, it's that area to the left of one, basically. Right. So that, that's just the definition. And, and again, for the in the next video, we'll come back to what the cumulative density function is useful for. So. Um, but um, you can approximate the, the cumulative, so, so big F is often used to represent the cumulative um, distribution function, call, also called the CDF um, in probability courses and statistic courses, right? So we can write um, a function uh, in Python. Basically, if we integrate from negative infinity up to X, that gives us the cumulative density, uh, and we can vectorize that function so here, so, so the blue one represents the, the, the density function, the, the PDF, the probability density function, and the, the orange represents the cumulative. And, and again, like for the discrete case, um, this is going to start off at zero and it's going to come up to one uh, once you get to the, um, to, 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 uh, to the end, to, to positive infinity. Or in this case, since it's zero, everything after two, uh, we end up at one um, at, at, at the value two for our continuous um, probability density function here. Um, okay, so that is kind of the first half of this video. So we, we covered these, these concepts here today. Uh, we talked about basic probability um, and, and how you come up with, with probabilities by counting things um, in sample spaces. Um, and we introduced the idea of the, dis of the discrete, uh, of, of probability distributions in general. Um, and looking at some um, what we mean by a discrete probability distribution and a continuous one and some properties of them. Okay? So in the next video, then, we're going to look at some specific uh, discrete and continuous probability distributions that are useful for doing um, scientific computations on uh, random statistical kinds of experiments. Um, all right, so that's uh, it for today, um, and I will see you later.